please take your seats. The next session is about to begin. Good morning, everybody. Um, it was always going to be difficult to get a, everyone in here on a Saturday morning, but thanks for making it. Um, if you want to move together, um, we've got 20 minutes, and uh, this is designed as a bit of a salon um, to reflect on... Uh, it was my idea, so to reflect on, on what people may be taking away from, from this. And if you remember yesterday morning, I was saying that it seems to me we're not, we're not navigating um, disruption yet. We're probably charting the waters for disruption. So what I'd like you to do is, if you've got the energy and the commitment to come here, and we delayed a few minutes in the hope that others would... Um, see that we're in here and want to come in as well before the first main session. Um, think of things which can be put on the agenda. Alex, the director of the, the whole Globsec experience, is here and is still looking for ideas, not just for later today, but also for what's coming up. So you can help input into the whole process of looking at disruption, because navigating disruption doesn't stop at the end of the conference this evening. It keeps going. It's part of a process. And it's about, um, it's about enabling you, emboldening you, not to be intimidated by what's happening, but how you can thrive on this change. And certainly, that's um, the spirit of this big project that I'm doing on Thinking the Unthinkable, not to be freaked by what's happening, but actually to embrace it, particularly those who are leaders who've been there a long time, who are really concerned that it ain't the same world anymore. And uh, secondly, the next generation, many of you as well, about what your expectations are, because what I think has come through, it's confirmed in the last 36 hours, just how much the structures are under real pressure. So let's just uh, look at a video about a minute long to help you remember what happened yesterday, or some of what happened yesterday. But it's not actually more intelligent. Uh, and so what then ends up happening is that we have dumber decisions being made much more quickly at a uh, global scale. And if we want to be a global actor, we have to be a regional one. We regret the Brexit for many reasons. Uh, we are going to deliver the Brexit if the UK still wants to leave. We can stay on our EU path. If you want us, take us. If you don't want us, we should take care of ourselves. We all have stakes in the unstable Balkans. We do see our advancement as an investment in the, uh, in the stability of the region. The mill-to-mill -mill relationship that NATO has with Turkey is, is as strong and as thick as it's been in the last decade. The Arab countries can be just as progressive just as global in their outlook and just as ambitious. We need this time to take a comprehensive approach and we can take that approach because of the strong engagement uh, at the highest levels on all sides. Companies have to focus far more on politics than they used to in the past. Countries don't trade with each other. Individuals trade with each other. Organizations, companies trade with each other. All right, we've got 15 minutes. Some of that was a little, seemed a little out of sync, but we've got 15 minutes. And can you get mobilize the microphones, please? Can we get the microphones switched on? Who would like to come in? I've got some things which I'd like to say, but any, anyone who's got a real takeaway. We were looking yesterday particularly at liberal democracy. Are Hungary and Poland still liberal democracies? And even Krastev, I think, saying that the judgment of, as to whether you can have a liberal democracy is whether the, the party in power can actually still be voted out. And the the view was that Hungary probably wasn't still a liberal democracy. We heard from uh, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, who was here immediately after I was sitting here yesterday, that our goal is to wake up every morning and guarantee 24 hours of peace. He's only been in the job 30 days, but he was, in, he was making it clear. And there you saw uh, what he was saying about Turkey and the, the real un uncertainties now about the Turkish purchase of the S-400 missiles from Russia at the same time as the Americans are providing F-35, the latest strike aircraft, and uh, the Americans are not actually even delivering 
uh, they're refusing to deliver the planes. But I was very struck, not just because he's the Slovak uh, foreign minister, uh, but by Miros Lajcak, uh, your foreign minister here in, in Slovakia, um, who is not only uh, the foreign minister, he's chairman of the OSCE at the moment, and this time last year was still the president of the UN General Assembly. And um, full disclosure, I was working as an advisor to him on our Thinking the Unthinkable project. But I think he sat here uh, at the beginning of the Brexit discussion with Michel Barnier, saying very clearly that um, life is tough. And he was worried about this uh, on the record and both off, off the record as well, or on background when he was at the UN, about this is a very difficult time. World structures are failing or falling apart. And it's going to be difficult to maintain a, a clear direction in the ways ahead. I'm just summarizing, not his words directly. But that spirit of deep uncertainty and disruption, and nothing's really going to be the same again. So let me just ask you to reflect, because this is, with Alex sitting here, it's designed as a as a way of you, and there's some of you from the next gen as well, which is really important. Don't be overwhelmed by the people in dark suits. Let's get the microphone here, please. Um, ideas, still things which are not on the agenda, big visionary things which we need to be considering. That's the idea of bringing you in here, or asking, inviting you in here at just after nine o'clock on a Saturday morning after a, a good evening in Bratislava, please. All right, Nick, thank you very much. Um, when I look around now in this room, I see a lot of young... Would you like to just uh, introduce yourself? Um, sorry, uh, my name is John Jacobs. I'm the founder of Atlantic Forum and a Dutch Army captain. Um, when I look around... Are you a serving room, Dutch Army captain? Serving, yes. Okay. And then the, the Atlantic Forum, promoting of nature, is something I do as a hobby, really. Um, but really with, with young people. And when I look around this room, I see a lot of young people. This has almost turned into a closed-door session for Gilf with you uh, as our speaker. Um, and yet I'm not speaking. I'm just here to convene. All right, and then with us speaking, lovely. Um, yesterday, we also had this in the session a bit. Um, we were talking about disruption, and then one of the guild participants said, right, we've been molded by this. Like, for us, this is normal. For us, this is not that weird. This is yeah. our way of living. And yet, you still refer to us as the next generation. Are we not the current generation, and is everyone who's not here now, because apparently it was not important enough, the past generation, are they not already like a... Good idea, yeah. I mean, that's, that's something, I think the classification and the, the kind of language you use is really important. I, I stand corrected. I mean, I'm just trying to, trying to find a way. If, you've, if you, in the next 10 minutes, can come up with a better way of... I, I hate the word youth. You know, many of you are probably in startups and actually doing very successful or, or actually taking big risks at the moment. Um, that's the way you want to run, run, run lives. I'm running a startup as well, and I'm of the... What did you call them? The older generation. The older generation. The past okay. generation. Okay. Old gen. Next old gen. gen. Old gen. Legacy the, the gen. Current gen. Old gen. Okay. Right. Don't um, don't get ageist about it though. No 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 no. 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 You you young from the inside. In, in, in old gen. Innovationary innovationary generation. Okay, but it's an important point. I yeah. I use next gen as a, a shorthand. So so here we can do that easily. Yesterday you mentioned with Nielsen, he, if he could, he replaced 30 percent of his staff of young people, but apparently he can't. What is it that we need to do to, to change that into our institutional thinking, to, to get career paths out of the way and get young people in? Shall I just mention, for those who were not there, uh, Manfred Nielsen, um, in fact, Alex and I saw him as well at the NATO 70th commemoration. Extraordinary. I, I didn't actually hear the, his full remarks, but I did ask him as well about the fact that he needs to replace 30% of his staff with actually the next generation, including maybe his granddaughter. Um, who's age nine or ten, which in a NATO structure is quite difficult. But just the idea that they've got to be much more, they've got to be many more people, am I, am I allowed to say next gen, who should be the inspired new people who actually understand all this stuff better than the people who've got a career, please. So I hear your point, yeah. Are you, are you picking all this up, Alex, about how we talk about the next gen, uh, legacy gen? All right, okay. Well, if, if in the next eight minutes or ten minutes we can come up with a better phrase which can go, get, go away as the, the globsec view of the generations, then that'll be a headline. Thank you very much. My name is Adam Neumann. I work at the Institute for Security Policy at Kiel University. We're there, a very young team, and I, when you asked us in the beginning, you know, do you have topics you want to bring up? Yeah, please. Disruptions? I thought it wasn't a topic, but now since, John, we speak about the different generations and that we need people to replace people in jobs, one thing that I feel that we don't talk about, which is not a disruption, but it will be a disruption, is this whole thing about uh, other demographics. 
demographics in the Western democratic countries that we know that's on decline. We do not have the young people. We, do not, we won't have the young people to fight actually our wars or any of these kind of matters. And it's still sort of mostly ignored. But sort of 20 years down the road, uh, we'll see there's actually nobody there. And uh, so at the moment, that's, I think, something we could be, should be talking about. So I think I, I absolutely agree with you. In fact, Admiral Ruhl from the German Defense Ministry said exactly that yesterday on demographics, but he didn't explain, he wasn't given time to explain. I mean, I think I would suggest to you that's a very, very serious problem about, about um, the, 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 the new equilibrium in populations and the demographics and exactly that. And he was saying to me privately, out, well, not privately, but I, I talked to him outside. He was saying, we're facing a serious problem of in the German military about whether we're going to get people coming in. And I was at the NATO Defense College last week. Many of the commandants of the colleges were saying, we're worried that because of the, the competition out there for skills, that the next gen don't want to, don't want to join the military, don't want to get in, into security. And I was told, for example, that the British um, Trident submarines, they've got a real problem at the moment, not from their missiles, but they can't get any cooks to actually serve on a submarine for four months. Same in Germany. Yeah. So if you want to earn 3,000 uh, euros per month, then you just learn cook and become uh, certified for a submarine. Yeah. So I think that's the best paid cook job. Well. So Alex, I mean, something which, which I think is serious is about, is about demographics and the... Who's, who's next, please? Yeah. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Patrycja Hamska from Globsecking Leaders Forum, Warsaw Security Forum, as my job. Uh, just following up on the remarks I made yesterday about we are living the disruption. I really think that our institutions aren't failing, those are the procedures that are failing. Our procedures are made for paper, not for digital work. Mm. And we are just not up to speed on how we are making the decisions, how we are implementing them. Those are things that are failing. Our institutions are fine. We are just not fast enough with making them work. Anyone else want to come in on that? Because Anyone else? Was it my hand going up over there? I mean, let, let me introduce some, um, as, as we're one of the content partners for the whole thing, for the whole um, um, uh, conference. That's exactly the kind of thing that we've been getting from people right at the top. And the, I'd like to take it one stage further. It's the human capacity to handle this, as opposed to just the institutions. And this came up actually in how business is handling sustainability and climate change. And everyone talks about an institution uh, by the nature of the way it's created, the way it's formed, the way it operates and so on, as opposed to the human beings who actually have the jobs. And those, I think, are real limiters at the moment. And the, uh, just to reflect with you the, the findings that we have, the conformity which qualifies people for the top actually disqualifies them from understanding the scale of what we're talking about. You're nodding, a lot of other people are nodding as well. And that's something which even the executive search firms are struggling with. They don't understand that there's got to be a different kind of person, which makes you ask the question of who are the le next leaders going to be and who wants to be a leader, because I think there are many in, the, in some generations who don't want to be leaders. Anyone else want to come in? I'm not sit sitting here to pronounce. I want to hear your ideas, but particularly picking up on the demographic ideas, please. We've got, we've got about seven minutes, so... Milo Jones, IE University. I want to make two points. First of all, I think what you're saying, I, I'm, I'm guessing, is that culture eats institutions and processes and strategy for breakfast. That's what's been and, coming out, I think, here. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The second point I would ask is, can you imagine, you're saying who wants to be a leader. Um, I would just put to the audience, can you imagine anyone who isn't a sociopath who would be willing to run <laughs> for elected office of any sort in democracies today? I, I think we have a system for self-selecting sociopaths to lead us. You have to be nuts to run for office. And I say that as a former U.S. Marine who's happy to serve, but not under the sort of scrutiny politicians get today. How many sociopaths did you have in the U.S. Marines you had to serve under? We all worked together. <laughs> Don't hand the microphone on yet. <laughs> no, but sociopaths, psychopaths. But there's another, there's another important issue here, which came out, and I'll find my notes here in a moment, about whether about the uh, about the nature of political parties and institutions, mm -hmm. that the way they're formed is according to a certain way of doing things up to now, and that has created 
that conformity. In other words, to get on in a political party, you've got to conform. To get on in an institution, you've got to conform, when actually you need the mavericks and the visionaries out there. I think the point was made at the democracy uh, discussion yesterday. What the populists have achieved is um, entertainment, and liberals and those of us who believe in old-fashioned things like the Enlightenment uh, are not good entertainers. And uh, those who are, if you will, leading countries like Hungary or, or my own nation, the United States, first and foremost, they're wonderful entertainers. And uh, so the Jerry Springer show is, is effectively become uh, the selection mechanism for uh, democratic leadership. Um, I would remind you all that the Greek, the, the Greek origin of aristocracy simply means rule by the best. So the question must be, how can we select the best of your generation without attracting the sort of person who actually wants to lead? I would suggest most European countries would be better ruled by 200 random selection, uh, randomly selected. Okay, well, let's, let's try anyway, it out. Here, here we let's, go. Let's try it out here. I'm, I'm quoting here from Carolina Vigura. Uh, from the Institute of Sociology at Warsaw University on the 30 Years of Democracy Lessons Learned session with Ivan Krastev yesterday afternoon. Um, Poland and Hungary are not liberal democracies. She then went on to said, say, they are on the way to something different. In other words, a different kind of politics. And I come from a country where politics is, is crashing to the ground. Um, anyone, any, any ideas about whether we should be talking about left and right, how we, how we address that particular point of a different kind of leadership and a different kind of commitment? The, the, those of you over there, come, um, do, you want, do, you want to, do you want to come in? I mean, you're the next generation. Who wants to be a leader over here? Yeah, do any of you want to be leaders? Okay, okay let's, hear, let's get the microphone down here. Um, Am I allowed to call them next gen? All right, I'm allowed to call them next gen. Right, please, the microphone. Yeah, tell me what your thought thinking is. So my name is Victoria from Masaryk University, and I am thinking about uh, when you were uh, talking about the right and left. I think that nowadays is most about entertaining, and it doesn't. You're the look... second person to use the word entertainment. Yeah, I know, because when I'm hearing all of the ideas, it just come through it, and so. I'm thinking, for example, in Slovakia, we are not really like dividing between left and right, but like who are the person of the top, who is the leader of the party, this is what this matters. So I think that sometimes uh, the people is more than the agenda itself. What do you think of the election of the new president? Because that's an interesting departure from normal politics here. Yeah, exactly. It was a uh, really surprise. And there was like two of blocks of people who were like, really pro-nations and try to push the far right at the top. And then there was like all of the other people who were, no matter if the, they were liberal or social democrats, they just come together and vote for uh, really like a liberal president. But do you, do, do you and those around you, uh, do you think left and right? Because I'd like to put to you that probably left and right is the old way of thinking. I don't know what the definition is, but what do you think? Do you think see it as left and right? I think it's uh, for certain things like in economics, it could be divided uh, like left and right, but in the normal policy, it's really hard. Definition of left and right, please. Uh, hello. Oh, I'm Billy McCarthy Price. I'm from Global Voices in Australia. And uh, for me, it's not about left and right. A huge number of the issues that we're going to need to navigate through the disruption are things like climate change, mass migration, mm. pandemics. They're things that we need to solve together. It's not about left and right. It's about working together, not only nationally, but internationally to overcome these issues. The EU is a great example. I know there's been a lot of feedback saying that it doesn't work effectively. At least it exists. And I think there's the conversation about systems and whether they work and whether they don't work. It, it isn't helpful, but at the same time, it's you know, you've been asking to change the systems for so long and now that they are under pressure and they are changing, then you're complaining about it. So it just seems, uh, you know, so a self-fulfilling prophecy in that you're trying to change something. Is it complaining about not. the system or complaining or, or, or push, we call it pushbackism, pushing back against a system which is not delivering? In other words, 
I think I could get a better, I, I could have a better way, of, a better, better form of life, better economic prospects, and I'm therefore pushing back against what's not delivering for me. Is that the same as complaining? Well, I think so, because if you're not bringing a solution to the table, then, then the, it, the system will never change. You can push back against it as much as you like, but it's not going to do anything. Okay. Can you pass the microphone behind you? Uh, thank you. Uh, Scott Conan, uh, visiting from Washington. Go ahead, uh, please. Uh, here's part of the Young Leaders Forum. And uh, just to uh, reinforce that point and add one uh, data point I think about, about how much this is not a, a right-left issue is that in uh, 2016, 13% uh, of Donald Trump's voters voted for Barack Obama four mm. years before, mm. uh, which of course is you know, far past uh, his margin of victory. So uh, certainly in the US and I think here in Europe, um, right left is not, uh, the, the ideological framework is no longer uh, the most uh, informative way to think about it. All right, please, someone over there has got the microphone. We're almost out of time, but I'm oh, trying to drive it as hard as I can to some kind of new takeoff point. Ah, well, I will be succinct. Since you asked about the, um, the left and right distinction, I would just like to draw this point of um, left being greater openness to internationalism and the right being more inclined towards nationalism. So, my point. Okay, thank you. Anyone else quickly? One of the things I said, please, yeah. One of the things I said to Alex when we were, we've been talking about this over the months is the danger of all conferences is to be too prescriptive. So this is aimed at finding out what else we should have had on the agenda and how more, more dynamic and more, even more imaginative we should be. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm uh, Zach Lambert. I'm also from Global Voices, uh, visiting from Australia. Um, I think we need to be uh, aware that, so in Australia recently we just had an election, um, everybody was extremely surprised by the outcome um, and we've noticed this sort of globally over the last few years that everybody tends to be very surprised by the outcomes of, of the elections that we've been having in our sort of liberal democracies. The problem is that if we keep being surprised by it, we're not adapting, we're not learning, mm. we, we don't truly understand what's happening and I think it, it tends to come down to a real lack of being in touch with the populace that we sort of are meant to lead and serve. Um, and there really seems to be a level of disassociation between the, what you might say, the educated elite and the people, the actual people who vote. In I think even Scott Morrison was a bit um, astonished that he won, wasn't he? Absolutely. But then, uh, final point, look what's just happened with the ABC where the police have gone in to find out where everything is from stories which appear to have been leaked about um, uh, bad behavior by Australian forces in Afghanistan. So that's, that, that's a real threat. Yeah. That's and a real disruption. In that context, uh, the, the pushback that the media has and, and that the, the people in Australia have against the actions that were taken there uh, has been quite significant. Okay, good. Look, at that point, I've got to stop you, but I think what we've done is shown that there is a way of, of bringing you in here at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning after whatever you were doing last night and actually still keep driving the agenda forward. Um, so let's move on to the uh, first panel of the morning, moderated by Chris Stokel -Water, Walker, who, and the subject is explosive data, and thanks all of you for coming. So yeah, just feel free to. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us so early in the morning here at Globsec on our third day. Um, some slightly weary faces, but I'm glad that you made it here after last night's gala dinner. We are, of course, discussing explosive data, the lifeblood of our times. My name is Chris Stokel Walker. I'm a freelance journalist for places like Wired, the BBC, the Times of London. Um, and I am joined by an absolutely fantastic panel. So we have, uh, going from 
left to right as you see them. We have Lindsay Gorman, who is the Fellow for Emerging Technologies at the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which is part of the German Marshall Fund. She's worked in the offices of Senator Mark Warner, uh, the White House Office of Society and Technology Policy, and the National Academy of Sciences. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for coming, Lindsay. Uh, in the middle, we have Michael Chertov, uh, former US Secretary of Homeland Security, and chairman of the Chertov Group. Um, he's also an illustrious career as a, a federal prosecutor, so thank you so much for joining us here, Michael. Uh, and then on the right, we have Gregory Garrett, who is our head of in US and international cybersecurity at BDO McLean. Uh, I think he's published more books than most people have read in their lifetime. Um, and he has three decades of experience in IT and cybersecurity programs for large companies and governmental agencies. So thank you so much for joining us all. Um, Lindsay, if I can just start with you. So the, the title of this panel is Explosive Data, the Lifeblood of Our Times. I mean, how did we get to this point where data has become so intrinsic in everything that we do? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think we've gotten to this point over a long period of time. And the point we're at now, I would say, really pales in comparison to where we'll be five, ten years from now. Right now, we have 127 new connected devices join the internet every second. Um, that corresponds to projections um, into 2025 of 175 zettabytes of data out there. That zettabytes is 10 to the 21st power. And uh, so for the, you know, the non-scientists uh, among us. But, but I'm a physicist, and in, in physics and in quantum physics, we have this idea um, of the power of aggregation, that more is different. Things are not just the sum of their parts. And I think that's especially true when we look to the future of data and the Internet of Things and of, and of these connected devices. In, in physics, in quantum physics, you can understand very well the behavior of a single atom in a molecule. And it's, it's very simple. You can describe it with, with quantum equations. Once you add a second atom, it becomes a little more complicated, a third, even more complicated, by four, you can no longer describe the system using your equations. Now, there are 10 to the 23rd atoms in a molecule. And that's how we give, give rise to the phenomena of, of human consciousness, of daily materials, of everything that we know in this world. And so I would posit that in the future, going forward, when we get to those 175 zettabytes of data, the power of our ability to analyze them will produce results that we can only dream of today. And those are for good and for ill. There are extremely important medical applications of big data. There are also some questions in terms of who owns this data and how that data can be used as a driver of great power conflict and as well as economic competitiveness. Mm, we have all sorts of things, and I, I want to touch on that with Michael and with Greg and with you as well later on. Um, just to remind people, uh, we are operating Slido uh, throughout the morning, so please do send in your questions from slido.com. We are in the Danube room, as you can tell by the fact that the river is just about 10 yards over that way. Um, so uh, if I can just go to you then, Michael, in, in terms of the sort of application of this data in, in law enforcement and national security. I mean, you've said, I think, in the past that uh, some of your greatest successes are the ones that we don't hear about. How does data actually feed into that? Well, if you go back uh, to the um, 20th century, when we worried about national security threats, we thought about bombers and missiles, and we had radar and other means of detection, and that's how we... Uh, gave ourselves the ability to intercept and disable something before it came to attack us. Uh, when we had the experience of September 11th, and I was at the Department of Justice in charge of the criminal division, then what we quickly realized was radar is not going to help you detect terrorists coming in in the stream of visitors. What ultimately does make a big difference is the ability to look at some data and begin to establish correlations that allow you to focus more specifically on people. And we actually, when I became Secretary of DHS, we took some of the basic data that we currently accumulate on travelers, which is really basic stuff. It's like your contact number, your address, your, your uh, itinerary. And we retroactively applied it to the 19 hijackers, and we realized that we would have been able to connect 15 of the 19 to each other and to known terrorists in the Middle East. 
which means had we had the program of analyzing that data back in 2001, they wouldn't have gotten into the country. So data really becomes the key way you, you take uh, hay off the haystack and then be able to focus on the needle. The downside is this. Data can be used for bad purposes as well or for commercial purposes. And I wrote a book called Exploding Data, very similar to the title of this, of this uh, session. And one of the reasons I did it was to demonstrate to people that the amount of data the government collects is minimal compared to what the private sector collects. And the uses to which the private sector uh, applies the data it are, is much less control than what the government is obliged to do with the data. And really, it was an attempt to have people understand how the, this massive collection of data, the ability to store data I I indefinitely, the ability to analyze it uh, in a way that no human being could do it because you can use machine learning, all of those things mean now that the private sector has more power over our lives in many respects than the governments do. Well, that leads us on quite nicely to Gregory. Private sector. I mean, you, you deal with an awful lot of cybersecurity aspects in the private sector, Fortune 500 companies. I mean, how does data help you in, in that? Well, said simply, I mean, data is the lifeblood of business. Uh, whether it's financial services, it's a health care it's uh, government contractors supporting government agencies, the retail sector. Uh, every industry is relying upon data. And the ability to be able to gather the data, store it, to retrieve it, analyze it, um, can be the differentiator between success or failure in the private sector. And so the private sector is, I'll say, going through uh, turbulent times as it relates to trying to mature their level of cybersecurity with the evolving threats and at the same time trying to be compliant with ever evolving government regulatory standards and public laws. And so it's, a, I'll say, an ongoing challenge for boards of directors and audit committees to try to figure out what's the appropriate level of risk, uh, what's the appropriate investment that needs to be made in order to ensure a level of compliance and security while still maintaining a level of profitability. So it, it is a very dynamic time in, uh, I'll say, the private sector, as well as most government agencies right now, to try to create that right balance between information access and information security. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these two things, the private sector and the public sector governments, interact an awful lot. I mean. How do we draw those boundaries between them? How do we make sure that, as, as Michael touched on, uh, often private sector companies who are outside of public scrutiny, how do you make sure that they are kept honest almost? Well, I, I would say from my standpoint, I think that w the key um, insight is that the idea of keeping your data confidential or secret is becoming a vanishing hope. And that's because what is out there about us is not only what we voluntarily put out, but everything that everybody puts out about us. So one of the things, you know, everybody here who might be tweeting about this session or took a picture, maybe will upload it to Facebook, you're all generating data about the three of us. And um, while you might think that the data is being held in separate silos, the likelihood is much of it is moving up to the cloud it may be the cloud service provider has the ability to aggregate all the data and look across all of the data and pick out what relates to each of us. And then there's other things at the same time generating data. My phone is on, there's locational data there. Um, you know, the fact that I'm in paying for the hotel with my credit card is data. And so no matter how hard you try, you can't keep yourself shut off. And that means the issue I think now changes to what is the control of the data? Who gets to decide what is done with the data? And that's what GDPR is about, and that's what I think the US is beginning to start to look at. And I mean, we have three North American representatives here. I mean, do, the GDPR, do you think that will be adopted? For, for those that don't know, the European Union uh, General Data Protection Regulations, is that something that we need, or do we need a code of ethics, do you think, Lindsay? Yeah, I definitely think we need some sort of code of ethics on how artificial intelligence is used. I mean, what's happening in Xinjiang is really a, a travesty and a tragedy that uh, kind of a dystopian case of data and artificial intelligence taken to 
perhaps a, an extreme conclusion. Um, on GDPR, I think there are probably elements of that that are going to be essential for the United States going forward. But there are also some unintended consequences of GDPR um, that uh, Marietta Schock uh, referred to um, in her, her initial panel um, along the lines of propping up big companies when they don't need it. Um, another one is that I think people don't really talk about much is the right to be forgotten. Um, when you think about that in the context of authoritarian regimes, the right to be forgotten is actually quite dangerous. Yep. And the, the Chinese government is aggressively erasing parts of its history, and that's not abnormal for authoritarian regimes. So there are probably some things that might need to be adapted about GDPR, GDPR as it gets exported elsewhere. But on the ethics side, I think I can't underscore this point enough. It's so important that we develop standards for how this stuff can be used, and we're able to call out misuse because we're really we're really ceding some moral authority yeah. um, in this domain. And, and part of that is because the private sector has taken such a lead on it and it's not, and the government has stepped back. Um, but I think from the US perspective, we're really, really absent from the conversation um, in a way that has potentially disastrous consequences for liberal democracies going forward. Mm. And Gregory, I mean, you deal with private sector an awful lot. Are they welcoming that or are they fearing that? Well, I think it's a, a mixed reaction at this point. Um, I think most companies recognize the inherent need for an ethical approach to securing personal identifiable information, protected health information, and payment card information. I think the problem is always in the details and the implementation and the enforcement, or in some cases, the lack of enforcement associated with these regulations. And in the case of the GDPR, it's a rather significant penalty that can be invoked on companies and sometimes potentially for relatively minor, I'll say, infractions of information security detailed requirements. <coughs> so uh, I, I think there's some room for improvement. Um, in the United States right now, we see the attorney generals of nearly all 50 states with a, a different perspective as to what constitutes privacy. And so there's evolving state laws. Uh, we have different industry sectors with specific cybersecurity requirements and, and mandatory compliance requirements, some by law, uh, some by, I'll just say, a contractual requirement. So again, there's a lot of complexity for the industry to try to figure out what's the appropriate level of investment to provide that security, but still at the same time be able to operate. Mm, and I mean, we, we kind of touched on that idea of privacy. Uh, I think Michael kind of went on it, and then also Lindsay was mentioning kind of the Chinese model. I mean, is, is there anything that any of you don't share on social media? And, and is it possible well, nowadays? In yeah, well, I, I don't do social media. Yeah. And I'm, I'm mindful of the amount of data I generate, although I think you all have to make a choice about the cost benefit of sharing data, but I don't think you should do it thoughtlessly. So, um, for example, I mean, I do have a, a watch that records my you know, running and stuff like that, and I've considered, do I, do I, am I happy with that data being generated, and on balance I am, but there are other parts of the data I'm not prepared to do. The thing to remember is this, um, if the data is collected, it can easily begin to affect your freedom. And that's why I've argued that this is no longer an issue of privacy in the sense that we normally think about it, but it's really about your autonomy. So imagine, for example, that your insurance company, I know you don't have private health insurance in, in Europe necessarily, but in the US you have private health insurance. Let's say your insurance company gets a hold of your, you know, your Fitbit data so they know how you sleep and how much exercise you get. Uh, your a credit card and your loyalty card at the supermarket so they know what kind of food you buy. If you, um, on the way home from work, stop for a beer, they know that. And let's assume at some point the insurance company says, you don't have a healthy lifestyle, so we're gonna raise your premium. <laughs> or let's say your employer says, you're not really healthy, so I'm not gonna promote you. Well, now you have always in the back of your mind that every decision you make, what you eat, when you go to sleep, what kind of exercise you get, where you go on vacation, all of those things may be re rewarded or punished. And that's an awful lot like having Big Brother, but I, I actually say Big Nanny watching you. And that strikes me as, as pretty much at the, at the core of what our freedom is about. 
And uh, Lindsay, I mean, you kind of touched on China. That's already happening now. Is, is that a model that you think will come over to the West? I don't think it will come over to the West um, in that wholesale way in terms of the government trying to do this. Um, so the the often talked about Chinese social credit model, which is actually a, a series of initiatives by, by local governments and private companies and potentially soon the Chinese Communist Party as well. Um, that it does exactly exactly what you've just said, punishing and blaming based on based on some more financial factors like owing debts to the government, but also some lifestyle factors. If you walk around enough per day, hit your 10,000 steps, then you're rewarded. Um, if you if you stay out too late, then you're punished. And it's it's a it's a weird world that I don't think we would be okay with nah, in the West. I hope not. Um, but on the other hand, we're willing to give this data to private companies all the time and, uh, and benefit from the really good recommendations that, that come of it. Um, but I think uh, on privacy, there's a bigger issue in terms of geopolitics. And we talk about data as the new oil and I think everyone has their, their opinions on which analogy is the best one. But the one, one reason I do like that one is that it speaks to the geopolitical implications. And privacy for democracies has an issue and you know with GDPR there there are controls and I think I worry that we may risk stifling innovation and, and I'm not sure what the solution is because obviously if we value our privacy then there's going to be some data we don't want to give up and some data that can't be combined into other data and used in ways that would constitute a big brother or big nanny surveillance but I was at a technology conference a couple weeks ago um, in Paris and there are a bunch of French companies there, European companies, and a couple Chinese companies. And the European companies said that what they can do in Hong Kong and China far outpaces what they're allowed to do in Europe. So in, in Europe, they can only take a video of someone's hands when they touch a product. In, in China, they can take a video of someone's facial expressions and how their eyes light up when they see a product. So I think this you know, surveillance capitalism model will be about economic competitiveness and the future of how we develop products. And so I worry that the innovators are going to be rushing to these looser, looser privacy restrictions because that's where they can derive economic value. Mm. And w we'll come to the audience in a little bit, so please do stop preparing your questions for our panel. But Gregory, I mean, in terms of that, let's just get down to sort of brass tacks here. Do you think it will be possible in the future for people to actually exist in society without giving up some semblance of data to these big companies or to governments? And I think the reality is we live in a world where some people are more comfortable sharing data than others, and uh, there should always be a lo an appropriate level of security. Um, I think most companies are trying to figure out what's the, again, the most cost-effective way to deliver that security. And it's very difficult because from a technological standpoint, and I'm an engineer by training, uh, the internet, when it was designed, was really designed as a communications platform. It was not designed for what it's being used for today, which is an electronic shopping mall, which is an electronic transfer of funds mechanism, uh, which is a uh, you know vast uh, expanded capability of providing goods and services. It was never intended for that. So the underlying platform is just a communications platform. And what we've had to do as we've expanded its usability is create a level of security somewhat artificially and as an add-on through technologies like software encryption, like multi-factor authentication, the use of biometrics, uh, the use of advanced monitoring and detection techniques. Uh, because we didn't use a platform that was fundamentally built with security in mind. I think as we evolve over the next decade or so, we'll see greater adoption of a more secure platform based upon blockchain technology, for, especially for secure contracts, electronic funds transfers. I think as we move to that, then hopefully we'll have the opportunity to share data in an appropriate way and have a more, I'll say, a greater confidence in the level of security for those more important secure transactions. Because really no one wants their electronic health records 
which is a great cost savings to the healthcare industry, uh, to have that information shared and appropriate with someone that has no right to that data. And unfortunately, um, if you go on the dark web, and I'm certainly not advocating that, right, <laughs> but um, those that do and those of us who have, you know, done that kind of reconnaissance know that um, years ago when we saw the, the rise of hacking, we saw what was monetized the most was credit card information, okay? Well, that's pennies on the dollar for credit card information today. What's the single most valuable information asset today besides uh, extremely important intellectual property and government secrets is your healthcare information. And there's a wide variety of nefarious reasons why uh, criminals and other organizations want to know that information. But uh, it's extremely important that we move to a secure platform so that that information can truly be protected. Hmm. And Michael, I mean, uh, as governments get more involved in creating data and handling data, we, we run the risk of data breaches of the most personal data. Do you think that governments are really prepared for this or are they catching up, as Gregory says? No, I think one of the things we've, we've learned is there's, uh, <clears throat> let's say, a great un unevenness in what government agencies do. There was an infamous story a couple of years ago where the Office of Personnel Management was hacked and about 25 million personnel files were stolen. And this includes background checks, which those of you who've been in the U.S. government know are extremely sensitive and thorough examinations of everything in your background. And... Um, apparently, the Office of Personnel Management didn't realize it had valuable information it needed to protect. And I believe, ultimately, the person who was in charge was fired. But, um, yeah, that's a serious issue because part of the commitment to collecting data is not only do you have to promise not to misuse it, but you have to have the capability to keep that promise. And that means you do have to have cybersecurity. And yeah, and if I, yeah, if I can just jump in, I think... So maybe I take a more uh, pessimistic take, unfortunately, but I think you know we're really not doing enough to secure this data. I mean, we can't we can't even pass basic IoT security legislation that would mandate you know non-default passwords. I mean, and these are devices that are in critical systems. Right. So as and you know energy energy security, our energy infrastructure, I mean, we're not just talking about our, our Nest thermometers that, I mean, which should be secure as well. Um, but we've, yeah, we've really struggled to even get the basics down on, you know, two-factor authentication, um, you know, political campaigns I also struggle with this immensely. Um, and then also on the, on the breach piece, I'm actually curious on, on, the, on the private sector perspective as well. I read a story a couple months ago, um, it was in the U.S. how... U.S. companies were, were underreporting their cyber breaches from uh, the, the Chinese intelligence unit that uh, has this ma massive export of intellectual property theft. And th there was an incentive issue because businesses didn't want to report it, one, because they had business in China and they feared that if they took, I think the Department of Justice wanted to take um, prosecutorial steps to to address these breaches, and I think it amounted to you know fif uh, 57 billion dollars uh, impact on our economy every year. This these data breaches, like serious IP theft, um, but businesses didn't want to report it. It also doesn't look good to shareholders, and so I, I'm I don't know. I'm just kind of curious, like how how can we incentivize companies when no in per no particular piece of data is inherently extremely valuable. I'm not sure how we do that to make sure that they're secure when in the aggregate their economic value is really our economic competitiveness um, as a nation and, and in the West. You know, it's, it's a very interesting challenge. It really is. And uh, for example, the Department of Defense in December, um, December 31st of last year, uh, implemented a new um, regulatory uh, standard uh, through the DOD uh, Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. And um, it imposes a set of new cybersecurity standards tied to the National Institute of Security and Tech uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And they refer to it as the NIST 800-171. And it's, um, I'll say, similar in nature to the ISO uh, 27001 uh, cybersecurity requirements. And 
essentially, again, it's a set of complex information security guidelines and some mandatory requirements. Um, but without enforcement, quite candidly, uh, by the Defense Contract Management Agency and the Defense Contract Audit Agency, government contractors are always, again, looking at what's the appropriate level of investment and what's the potential fines or penalties associated with it because they're trying to balance the profitability versus the security versus the compliance. And so if I've sounded a little bit uh, redundant on that point, that is the key point to industry, is uh, they're trying to make that balancing act because they will live in a world of profitability. And so it's an investment and it's a risk and reward uh, decision. So it's, um, and, and that's a challenge. And it's not just the government contractors, but it's also the financial services sector, which is highly regulated uh, in the United States. It's also the healthcare industry. Uh, they're all struggling with how do we create that level of security. And the problem is, and, and again, um, if this sounds a little unusual coming from a technology guy, but the problem is really not the hardware and the software, it's really the human factor. Um, it's about creating the right kind of situational understanding of cybersecurity because the weakest link is the human element. You can have the most advanced encryption and detection capabilities and monitoring systems, and if someone gets bribed and they give away their passwords and their credentials, then boom, they've got access to the entire system. So some of the biggest hacks that we've seen in the world is from insider threats. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of attacks uh, come into companies through spear phishing and other campaigns um, simply because people have been not properly educated and trained as to um, the vulnerabilities associated with these type of attacks. And so until we can not only put in the right hardware and software, make those investments, but invest in the people and create a culture of real security. I mean, too often companies that I talk to, they think that the IT people <laughs> are the only people that need to know about cybersecurity. The reality is, you know, when I talk to the boards of directors of major corporations, I look at them and I say, you're the weakest link. And they go, well, what do you mean? I said, you've got the greatest access to information. You're probably practicing the least security, and they're more likely going to target you and get access through the CFO or other senior executives and get into the entire you know, opportunity to seize that data. And Michael, I mean, in, in your time in government, I mean, talking about that insider threat that Gregory talked about, um, as you collected more and more data, was that kind of a concern that, it would leak out through the human way. Well, I think not only is it, is it a question of, you know, people deliberately leaking things or deliberately removing things, but frankly, a lot of times it's human error. I mean, some of the worst breaches have been because someone clicked on something that they should have known not to click on. Right. Part of it is a training issue. Part of it is a natural human tendency um, to be curious about things and and... I mean, many of the hackers are really masters at psychological manipulation. And so one of the things, I mean, when you start to look at, at cybersecurity, what I, what I hope we've learned um, is it's not just about the perimeter. The perimeter is a, is a very weak shield. It's about what goes on inside the network itself. And so it's how you organize and architect the inside of your network, how you segment it, what kind of access, requirements you have, who gets privileges to alter things or change things, and even monitoring in real time behavior on the network using tools like artificial intelligence allow you to see when there's something that's problematic, whether it be uh, someone hacking from inside or someone in inside making a mistake. So, But I think the biggest problem, honestly, my, in my experience in the private sector, is that for many people who are running businesses, they are so overwhelmed with various kinds of products and tools that are being sold that they feel like they're going to bankrupt themselves by buying everything. And so then you get the phenomenon of, I can't figure out what to do, so I'm just going to pray that I don't get attacked. 
And what I find is it's really important to get people to have a realistic set of expectations, and then that empowers them to make reasonable steps to secure themselves. So the example I always give is this. Um, if you believe that your aspiration or your aspiration is never to get hacked, that's like going to your doctor and saying, doctor, I never want to be sick again. The doctor will laugh you out of his office. Your body is designed to keep viruses and bacteria out, but your body's not organized with the expectation that it's going to be 100% successful. That's why you have white blood cells and an immune system, so that when something gets in, you can characterize it, and your body then kills it if you're, if you're a healthy individual. And then the next time, you've got an immunity. And that's kind of the model I like to tell people about with cybersecurity. You want to keep stuff out, but you also want to be able to detect when things do get in, as they will. You want to be able to characterize it. You want to be able to get rid of it as quickly as possible. And then you want to develop an immunity the next time that happens. Does that kind of fill you with dread, Lindsay, that idea? Are we, are we prepared for this sort of thing, do you think, or not, on a private uh, side? Actually, actually, not at all, that one. I think that, that seems like a very sensible model. And you know, I agree that we're it's impossible to stop anything 100%. I think we see this in disinformation as well. We're never going to stop all the information that's flooding our systems. It's about keeping up. I mean, I think it's a similar concept in, you know, deep fakes everyone's talking about now, trying to, you know, outsmart the deep fake. It's, it's, it's a similar thing in the cyber world where we're just trying to get better and better and raise the bar for the sophistication of the actor that can cause massive yeah. um, economic harm. Um, so so that, that doesn't really... Uh, <laughs> but don't, go, 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 go. So if, if I could uh, just build in on what you said, Michael, I, I like really like the analogy. And in fact, uh, I frequently use sort of a different version of that when I talk to uh, C-suite executives. I said, you know, um, looking at a cybersecurity standard and then looking at how you your organization compares to it is sort of like going to a doctor and asking them to open up your medical records and then predict what your future health is going to be. I said, so, you know, as a cybersecurity doctor, and in many ways I consider myself that, um, I say the appropriate place to start is to first understand what threats that you might be facing, whether if you're a government contractor, nation state threats or organized crime or a combination of the two or some hacktivist. And then it's going in and doing diagnostics, just like a doctor would uh, ask you, let's you know, take your blood pressure, let's do an EKG, maybe an MRI, some diagnostics to see how the body is doing. Um, when I start with clients, I recommend, hey, let's do a vulnerability assessment, scanning of your computers. Let's do some advanced penetration testing. Let's do an email and network attack assessment. So, and let's run a spear phishing campaign on your organization to understand the level of awareness and gather all that data so we can get a holistic viewpoint of your level of security and defense. And, and I think that kind of analogy people can relate yeah. to uh, because it's uh, using common sense and to try to use the technology in a way that can really achieve the kind of results that you're looking for. Because to your point, so many of the companies are overwhelmed because there's such a proliferation of software and hardware and every software company says theirs is the panacea that's going to you know, give them ultimate security. And unfortunately, I've never seen it. Yeah. And so if this is a data literacy problem then, if, if we have too much confusing information on one side and just too little knowledge of the risks on the other, on a personal and a business and governmental level, how do we fix that? Whose responsibility is that? Is it government messaging? Is it private industry, Googles, Apples, Facebooks, Amazons of this world? Who, who should be in charge of trying to re-educate us about our data and usage of it? I mean, I think governments have not stepped up. I, I mean, I, th I would say probably all of those actors, uh, you know, need to need to be, you know, at the table, but governments, at least, at least in the U.S., have not really pulled up the chair in the way that they should and maybe at the head of the table, potentially. Um, but I think also people don't care that much about their personal information. That's just the reality. I mean, they're willing to, I think we're all mostly willing to trade that for the economic benefits and the, the convenience factor. 
So, you know, we, I think in the counterterrorism case, uh, you know, five or ten years ago, there was this trade-off between privacy and security. But now I really think the trade-off is between privacy and economic activity. Um, and so I think we're, we're you know, we're, we're willing to give up this data. What we need to think about is what are the geopolitical implications? Who, who owns the data? I mean, one example is that there was this, there's a, a Russian data cloud storage company that a couple of years ago was discovered, uh, maintained the voter registry in Maryland, one, one, one polling place Ouch. in Maryland. <laughs> I mean, and, and actually the same company had DISA contracts, Defense Information Security Agency, and DOE contracts um, that were, uh, who knows what they're, they're storing, but you know, we had absolutely no due diligence on the investor side and the fan financial investor side of who owned, who owned this data company, just because I don't think it was on our radar. And I think there's something similar with the, you know, the amount of Chinese investment in Silicon Valley, the defense innovation unit has done a pretty significant report on that. And, you know, these things may be okay, and they may not be, but we need to decide, we need to at least be looking at them from the point of view yeah. of great power politics, because you know, if data is the lifeblood, then that's going to be the driver of competitiveness. Um, and the idea that we can fully segment out the economics and the national security, I think, is, is an issue of the past. Um, President Kiska, uh, a couple days ago, said that, you know, recognize that the 5G, networks are going to have a significant impact in, in building out this IoT model. And he said, you know, we're worried about the fairness of government procurement and we should be worried about security. So I think that's the element that we just really haven't considered that. And, and on the, you know, authoritarian democracy side of things, all this data has the potential to make authoritarianism a more attractive model. So there's a historian, you all know, a Harari, who, who talks about this. And he has an interesting thesis that in, in the 20th century, the communist model was unsuccessful economically because centralized governments were trying to control and make decisions on, in the farms in the provinces. And that w wasn't really effective because they couldn't, they couldn't make good decisions. In this century, where there is data attached to every corn row, that may actually be a very effective model and, and may be possible and allow autocrats to provide attractive services to their population. So these are the kinds of questions that I don't think governments, I don't think the private sector, I don't think anyone's really thinking about, um, but it needs to, it, I mean, it definitely needs to be the, the whole of government or the whole of society, whatever you want to call it. Um, the private sector is, I think, at least in the U.S., I would say the private sector is probably thinking about it more than more than the governments are at this point. Yeah, I, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, on, on this last point, um, Freedom House, and I'm, I'm chairman of the board of Freedom House, uh, does a report every year on freedom in the net. And the last report that came out talked about how the Chinese are exporting their technology. And part of the export is they go to certain countries and they tell the leadership, this is a great tool to surveil your population. And they actually bring people back to Beijing and they have courses in how you can use the technology to better exert control over the populace. Um, and so, I mean, this, I think what we are, as has maybe been the case in other areas too, our technology is outstripping our political institutions right. in terms of an understanding of what the real issues are uh, and then also an ability to react to that. Are we seeing a kind of butting up of those two in an acknowledgement with, with the Huawei situation, do we think, at the minute? Yeah, I mean, I think there was a very good uh, session here yesterday on 5G. Um, I don't know how many decision makers who are involved in this process are fully aware of the difference between 5G and 4G and the effect that controlling the equipment and the infrastructure and setting the standards is not just about how well your phone works, but it's gonna be about literally everything. And uh, you know, you can debate these things, but you should ideally debate from a standpoint of having an awareness of what the real issues are. Right. And Greg, I mean that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And, and again, um, technology is far ahead of uh, both regulations, the lawmaking, um, the level of security. Um, we see companies spending extraordinary amounts of money to try to provide an appropriate level of information security and information integrity. Um, 
but yet, again, all hackers have to do is find the weakest link to be able to penetrate, and often, again, that's a human element. So it's an incredibly difficult challenge, and the reality is um, trying to keep pace with it is until we can change that underlying platform, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're in an uphill battle for probably the next decade or more. And Michael and Lindsay are both correct that the underlying infrastructure associated with this um, and being able to advance to the next level, both for good and bad, is 5G technology. And there's a lot of hype today in the United States and in China about the level of capabilities in that space. As a technology guy, I will tell you there's a lot of hype. <laughs> there's not as much actual infrastructure there and capability as the marketeers of the world would like people to believe. But the reality is that is the future of communications and security is tied to that evolution of that technology. And so that's an extremely important decision for governments to make and to have the right kind of regulatory guidance associated with it. The real challenge is that government needs to get ahead of technology, and it hasn't been. Okay. I mean, we've seen governments and politicians trying to catch up. We have a question from Slido, someone who is uh, perhaps listening to our panel and thinking that they would rather be anonymous. Um, <laughs> were the Facebook hearings enough to deter other companies from selling users' data in a non-transparent way? And, and if not, what would be a deterrent for them? I mean, Lindsay, you kind of talked a little bit about the commoditization of data. I mean, that goes for personal use and also the companies selling this. Do you think that politicians kind of slapping Facebook down is working or not? I don't. I think, I mean, if I, if I ran a company, uh, you know, you're beholden to your shareholders. You're going to do what's in your economic interest. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's it's the job of governments, I mean, potentially through regulation, to uh, you know smooth out those those parts where they interfere with with national issu issues that concern the entire society. So I think, I mean, certainly maybe the first step is the naming and shaming and blaming, um, and we've certainly done a lot of that. But you look at what the result of that has been in the Facebook hearing case, and they've announced they're going to a privacy-focused model, which sounds great. It sounds great. But the whole point of this was to counter disinformation, that, that the idea that the Russians were interfering in our election and using social media and using the data that they were able to get through Cambridge Analytica and other companies and, and advertisers to influence us. And that's only going to increase when we have all these, and everyone has a Fitbit and more, and, and a smart home and their their car, you know, I, I worked on the first generation of the DARPA autonomous car project you know, on, the, on the engineering side. And when we're all driving cars or well, they're driving us, all that data is going somewhere, everywhere we go. I mean, yeah. it's already it's already on Uber, I think. I mean, Uber had a horrendously offensive study a couple of years ago on like one night stands. And they, they tracked people who had, you know, they went to an apartment that wasn't theirs, and then they left and took an Uber in the morning. And it was just, you know, this bizarre case of uh, technology in the hands and, and data in the hands of someone who's making a joke of it. But, I mean, the alternative could actually be way worse in terms of exposing data. But I think, on, you know, on the Facebook stuff, now they're going to this privacy-focused model, which is actually going to make it impossible almost to police disinformation because every, all, all our applications and communications are going to be encrypted. And you know, we see this in, in WhatsApp in India. They have an extreme problem with disinformation um, spurring, in some cases, some fairly violent, yeah. violent killings um, based on disinformation on WhatsApp that is extremely difficult to police. So I think when we, you know, when we do these, when we, we have these hearings and we have regulation, and I think this is a conversation that's going to start in, in the U.S. in terms of how we deal with it, we need to be cognizant of some of these unintended consequences and, and not just let the private sector say, oh, now we're, we're focused on privacy now um, without thinking of the real consequences to our democratic values. And does that concern you, Michael? I mean, 19 hijackers, 15 of them would have been found had you've been able to analyze that data if it all goes into the private Well, I, I, see, space. I think that I think the government is, a, at least in the U.S. and I think in Europe, is accustomed to a highly regulated environment in which information is collected and what's done with it is is structured very carefully. I think the private sector, to the, to the point of the question, I think sometimes the 
private companies don't even really understand what happens to all the data that they collect. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago that a lot of the apps that are designed generate data, um, which is supposed to be helping in terms of the efficiency and the, and the um, uh, usability of the app, but also has a lot of collateral consequences. And remember, in a world in which you, know, you have a platform, but it may be interacting with a lot of other platforms or apps or um, you know, other features, the ability to have full visibility to how all those interact, I frankly think is beyond the capability of a lot of companies. And that's why I think my observation with Facebook is I think they're scared now, but I think they're continuing to discover that their ability to really understand what is on their platform is um, suboptimal. Mm -hmm. um, we're into sort of the last sort of 10, 12 minutes of our panel, so I'm really keen to get some thoughts from the audience. Um, yeah, so we have one question down here at the front. If we can start with that, then we'll go to the gentleman behind. Um, morning. Um, uh, so, do you expect some of the um, Western countries to turn into, um, so as to speak, um, digital police states in the footsteps of uh, China and Russia? And s some of these countries are, are actually on their way of doing so. For instance, um, Hungary's Orban. It's an authoritarian model. It's very attractive to him, and he's very keen on replicating this facial recognition technology. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for the brief question. Uh, I should have said yes. We want to keep these very, very tight. So yeah, what do we think about this as potentially moving over into? I, I think I think you'll get some. I mean, we've seen a rise of authoritarianism in different parts of the globe. I think you'll get some. Um, Increase in that, I think some of that will be fed with the data, although to be honest, in many cases what you're um, seeing in authoritarianism is not so much data-driven uh, efforts as uh, a few kind of populist points being elevated and, and, and uh, you know, driven home as a message. I think if you look at, for example, Brazil, um, I don't think the new president of Brazil who's talking about, you know, killing uh, you know, criminals and things of that sort is doing it based on data. I think it's kind of more of a of a visceral instinct. But there's no doubt that the accumulation of data creates the potential for a level of surveillance and control, which is why, as I said earlier, the Chinese are uh, inviting the leaders of some of the countries where they put their technology to actually come and take a course in how to use this to establish better social control. Yeah, and there, I mean, I think the New York Times headline put it really well when it said made in China exported to the world. It's not just in, in Xinjiang that this yeah, is right. going on. I mean, it's in Ecuador, it's in Malaysia, it's in the right. Philippines, it's in the Gulf. So, I mean, am I worried that facial recognition mass surveillance is going to happen um, in in Paris? I, I'm not sure. I think the difference is it's really important to have a strong rule of law. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with using facial recognition, in, in my view at least, if it's done in accordance with the rule of law. And I mean, in San Francisco, they just passed, a, passed something banning facial recognition. And you know that's, that's their prerogative. Um, I think the problem is when you don't know where your data is going. You don't know how that information is going to be used. Um, China, in 2017, they did a demonstration with BBC where they were able to locate a BBC reporter within seven minutes in the country using you know, their network of 100-plus uh, million cameras. And this is, this is happening everywhere. Russia has decided to expand its facial recognition pilots in Moscow to hundreds of thousands of cameras. And uh, from the kind of democracy authoritarianism angle that I think you're getting at, I really do worry about some of these countries where there isn't as strong a rule of law and as strong a civil society that can come in and say, no, this is actually something we don't want. But the countries that are sort of teetering on the edge of democracy and authoritarianism, this is how I think China can export its model. Because when you buy these surveillance technologies, it comes with command yeah. center, it comes with how to use it, and, and in some ways it's incredibly useful. A lot, I mean, a lot of these countries ha do have crime problems that need a solution. And uh, the use of the data is, you know, in, tr in tracking people in crowds, you can see when someone's about to act. Uh, and it's, it's very sci-fi 
ask, but it, it's a useful technology. So I think it wouldn't be surprising if countries adopt it not thinking it's going to have implications for the rule of law or for democracy, and it ends up bringing those values along with it. Mm. Do you want to have anything on that, Greg? Or? Yeah, just two quick points. One, I, I think it's important to note that nation states today, and especially what I'll refer to as rogue nation states, uh, that are bad actors in the world of uh, cyber attacks are frequently and in, in, in increasingly working with organized crime, uh, not only within their country, but on a multinational basis, and using organized crim uh, crime groups as surrogates for, for their attacks. We're seeing this all over the world, especially in the more developed countries. And so it's not just the nation states. I think that needs to be recognized and understood. Also, again, from a technology standpoint, you know, I'm concerned while I see great advantages to the use of biometrics, whether it's facial recognition or fingerprints or uh, other forms of biometrics as a way of uh, providing greater uh, information security through multi-factor authentication. But just think about it, if you're giving up your fingerprint information and facial recognition and others, all that's being collected in databases which are ultimately hackable and then that information which you're relying to provide a greater level of security can then be provided to then gain access to those systems. So from a technology standpoint, it is an ongoing challenge to try to stay ahead of the hackers here. Mm, absolutely. We have another question from the audience here. There you go. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Rand Waltzman from the Rand Corporation. So at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA, I ran a $50 million research program on insider threat detection, which everybody thinks is a big problem. The difficulty I had was that all of the techniques that we developed required massive amounts of data and very intrusive stuff. I couldn't get anybody, anybody to try any of the stuff that we had developed or even to consider, even, a DARPA, even the director of DARPA refused <laughs> to allow me to do an experiment. At DARPA. So my question is, how do you balance, the, you know, the, the the rules about privacy of access to data with the needs of counter internal counterintelligence people? Because if things continue as they are now, people can keep whining about insider threat, but the problem won't get fixed. Yeah, I mean, I, that's I think that's exactly the point that. You know, we may be hamstrung by our privacy requirement. There, I think there's another DARPA initiative now that's looking at something called privacy-preserving machine learning and federated data approaches where they encrypt the data and still try to learn on it or separate it out instead of aggregating it and still try to do machine learning. Those are not the most effective machine learning models right now. Uh, the current state of the art does require amassing that data, so you're right, I, but I would, I would say we do need to double down in those technologies that may be able to get us out of this bind a little bit and also develop standards and you know responsibility about ownership of data if if we trust that the actors holding the data are going to do it responsibly and and I don't think there's a good reason to right now um, then maybe we may be more comfortable aggregating it in in certain scenarios but it's yeah, I think it's a it's a problem. Yeah, and I, I, I would add, I mean, I think there are, you know, there are middle positions to be taken. For example, for certain kinds of jobs, people might legitimately be asked to waive their privacy interests, uh, you know, if you want to get a certain level of clearance or things of that sort. I also agree, I think there are uh, efforts now being made to, to find ways to have encrypted data analyzed and patterns looked at by machines, uh, but not... Uh, decrypting the data unless until you've got a hit on something that indicates a, an issue. So we may have to get comfortable with the idea of disaggregating the process of surveillance and treating certain elements of it as something that we would allow to happen on the understanding that no human being is going to look at, at it or no action is going to be taken unless you cross a certain threshold of probable cause or some legal standard. So I think these are all issues that have to be experimented with. Mm, absolutely. And um, we are rapidly running out of time, and I'm slightly worried that this tent is going to end up in the Danube in a couple of minutes. So um, <laughs> if we can just have one very final quick question and then one very final quick answer from our panel, I think. Uh, Christian, it's Austrian television and Austrian radio. I mean, cybercrime is also crime.
and all st uh, statistics are showing us that this cyber crime is rising and rising. What does it mean for uh, the development and technical development of law enforcement agencies and international cooperation? Because then maybe in some years an, an old style burglar uh, will look like a person from Stonehenge, uh, Stone Age because crime is developing completely on different levels. Go well, I mean, I, I think what we do need, to, I agree with you, I think cybercrime is, and, and not just cybercrime, but cyberterrorism and even cyber conflict are increasing problems. And one of the key issues here is to come up with a better mechanism for cooperation among countries on dealing with these issues. Unfortunately, a lot of cybercrime now is generated from parts of the world in which the governments either are unwilling or unable to really enforce the rules. And I think we've got to um, either find a way to help the ones that are incapable and the ones that are unwilling maybe need to be uh, treated as um, responsible in part for what's happening and be held accountable and responsible for what's happening. Lindsay or Gregory, do you want to come on that very quickly before we wrap up? No, we're good. Perfect. Well, brilliant. Okay, that, that makes it even better for me. That means that the person in my ear won't be super, super angry at me. Um, thank you so much for a really enlightening and enthralling discussion. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope that that's shaken off some of the uh, hangovers that we may have had. Uh, don't forget you have your coffee session right now, and then after that, uh, we are back here at 11 a.m. with Steve Forbes and Senator Ron Johnson. Um, please uh, do please give it up for our panel, and thank you so much for coming out today.